<laughs> hey guys, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Uh, we've got an exciting program for you today, talking about union with Christ. I'm here with Hunter Heisman. It's going to be an exciting program today. Before we dive in, uh, wait. Before we dive in, no, let's just run that that beautiful intro clip, and then and then we'll dive in. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Boy, is it the show for you if you're out there and you're like, man, I union with Christ. What are these guys talking about? I might be talking about some hypostatic union sort of things. You might learn a new word today. They a tokos. That'd be a fun word to learn. We'll, we'll see what happens, uh, but it's going to be fun. We're going to talk a lot about uh, the uh, the humanity of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus, how those two things are articulated in an orthodox way. It's an extremely important thing to discuss. Uh, and as Christians, it's kind of all, like the center point of our Christian faith of talking about who God is. Uh, but before we dive into all of that, I want to remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. So if you want to support the channel, there are links in the description. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal. It's the top link there or on Patreon, the link right beneath it. If you choose to give on Patreon, as low as five bucks a month, you'll get access to extra content, including, I don't know, like behind the scenes stuff that goes on here at Remnant Radio, uh, some extra long interviews where we film some extra stuff behind the scenes sort of things. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to my friends. I've got Hunter. Well, that's not it. Well, I don't know how that happened. Uh, I've got Hunter right here uh, and my other friend, Michael Roundtree. Michael, do you want to, I don't know, witty banter? How's your, how's your day going? witty banter isn't one of those things that you do on command it just has to like come out so maybe well, josh just just look for it during the show i'll try to make fun of you at some point without further ado let me introduce to my new friend hunter hunter tell us about yourself and your ministry before we dive in yeah absolutely so um, like i said my name's hunter heinzman uh i'm a, an associate pastor at a church in gadsden alabama so that's northeast alabama uh, married to my wife, Taylor. We have four kids, uh, all under five. So our house is pretty crazy right now. Uh, I'm a PhD student at, at Southern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, studying the early church, particularly Justin Martyr, uh, natural law, virtue, those kind of things in, in his writings and, um, and have written a, a couple of things, uh, book reviews uh, for the, uh, the Gospel Coalition, one on uh, Basil's uh, Only Holy Spirit, and then also Cyril's on the unity of Christ. Um, I'm the patristic editor at the London Lyceum. And, um, but yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about my, my life and ministry in a nutshell, really uh, enjoying the season of, of ministry and of study uh, at Southern, studying under Dr. Stephen Presley. With all that writing that you're doing, is, is video calls like, is, it, is this like a unique thing for you? Because the amount of writing you do, and I, I, I apologize in advance when I sent you the show notes. I'm like, I didn't spell anything right. So uh, good luck <laughs> interpreting it all. Uh, yeah. you, you do a lot of stuff with writing. It, do, you, do you do a lot of video content? And if not, this might be this might be the little push to get you out onto the YouTube space. I'm curious. Yeah, so I don't I don't do too much video uh, content. There's, there's something in the works that me and another brother over at London Lyceum are working towards. Um, and uh, can't really give too much information on that just yet, but we're moving towards that. Um, but yeah, most of my stuff is either live preaching and teaching or, or writing. Uh, this is actually my cool. first video interview. So Hey, hey, we're, we're, we're yeah. glad to break you into the space. Uh, today we're talking yeah, about good. Union with Christ. You did uh, an article with the Gospel Co Coalition, like you said, uh, on Cyril of Alexandria, uh, talking about Union with Christ. Could you maybe introduce us into the subject, uh, the kind of theological language. I mentioned the word theotokos just a moment ago. Uh, people might not be super familiar with that. Could you maybe frame the discussion for us today before we dive in? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the book I reviewed is the, um, I can hold it up right here so you can see it, but it's uh, On the Unity of Christ. Uh, it's a, it's one of those kind of Christological classics uh, of the of church history. And it's, um, it's written as a dialogue between two speakers, Speaker A, who is Cyril, and Speaker B, uh, and their speculation about who he is. And really, in the kind of the beginning of the fifth century, uh, you have this kind of Christological controversy that erupts, um, really between Nestorius and, and Cyril, um, you know, simplifying this, this a little bit, of course. And you have some back and forth. You have some letters that are exchanged uh, between Cyril and Nestorius, where you know, both of them think each other is, is heretics and there's some politics. It's a really kind of fascinating story as you have a couple councils uh, right there um, 
uh, I think 431 and 454, uh, and Calcedon being 454, which is after I think both of them. Um, and so really the controversy cent centers around that term that you've mentioned, uh, which is Theotokos. Um, and so this idea of Mary being the Theotokos, which literally just means God bearer, uh, the, the God bearer, or as uh, it is really better translated into um, English or the kind of the phrase, which is Mary is the mother of God. Um, and that's kind of the, the phrase that really kickstarts this whole um, controversy between Cyril uh, and Alexandria and uh, Nestorius uh, in, in kind of the more uh, eastern um, areas. I want to say Antioch-ish. Okay, so talk to us a little bit more about, so you have this duel taking place between Cyril, Cyril and Nestorius. What can you tell us about Cyril and what can you tell us about Nestorius before we dive too deep into like just the details of their conflict with one another? What do we what do we know just in terms of sort of their their biography? Not necessarily like how many kids they have and that kind of deal, but um, just maybe a little bit more about who they are. Yeah, I mean, I think just really um, the, the 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 key thing that, to know about them is that these are two. Uh, bishops or patriarchs, uh, people who are doing ministry in the church um, around the, the beginning of the fifth century. And Cyril is in Alexandria and uh, and he's and he's writing in, in that stream. And um, Nestorius is in Constantinople. Uh, so there, he's he's a, you know, a pastor in, in those ways. This this period is, a, you know, like I said, a little bit behind my uh, a little bit after my primary focus. Uh, but the general gist of things is which, which you really need to know is that here you have these two men who are pastors or bishops, uh, patriarchs, serving in the church, uh, ministering in the church, teaching, uh, trying to teach people about who Christ is and how they can come to know him and, and then ultimately be saved. Okay. Uh, so, but they, but they have a different Christology, a different understanding yeah. about the nature of Christ. So uh, could you explain to us Nestorius's view of the nature of Christ and Cyril's view of the nature of Christ? Yeah. So I'll walk through a little bit of Nestorius's view. Um, Nestorius's view is, is a little bit um, complicated to kind of understand. Uh, one of the things that makes it complicated is because there's a lot of uh, what is what people are typically referred to as, as classical theism. And uh, I should have a, a definition written right here that could be precise. But really, classical theism is the belief that God is uh, simple, I say, which is from himself, uh, immutable, impassable. Uh, he, he creates the world from nothing. Uh, and I think there's a, a few other other things that I could highlight there. But that's that's pretty much a good, a simple uh, definition just uh, from the top of my head. But that idea of impassibility, divine impassibility, the God, the idea that God uh, cannot suffer and is not affected uh, by his creation or uh, passions that are in, within God that are not who God is. Um, th those that doctrine has uh, diminished in popularity uh, amongst um, evangelicals uh, over the 20th or 19th and 20th century into the 21st. So understanding the debates uh, really until you really need to understand some of the things about classical theism, particularly divine impassibility to understand what's going on. But Nestorius was really rubbed the wrong way by the term Theotokos because he thought it prescribed to God um, with the divine logos, uh, things that were improper to him. Things like being born, um, dying, suffering. He, he just, he could not, he could not get, get behind uh, such a teaching. Um, let me see, I have a, a quote right here by him. He says, uh, to, to, to attribute also to Christ in the name of this association, the characteristics of the flesh that has been conjoined with him, I mean, birth, suffering, and death is my brother, either the work of a mind who truly errs in the fashion of the Greeks or that of a mind diseased with the insane heresy of Arius and Apollinarius and, and the others. So the story is, is view of... of of Christ is is really that of a participation. Uh, that what I mean by that is is Christ is um, it's a personal union of of two persons, uh, the divine logos and the human being um, of Christ. So it's he says it's obvious that the son of David uh, was not the divine logos. 
he he says that I revere the one who is born because of the one who carries him. I worship the one I see because of the one who is hidden. God is undivided from the one who appears. Therefore, I do not divide the honor of that which is not divided. I divide the natures, but unite the worship. Um, he really is very loose in his understanding of the union, uh, such that when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, uh, and really the Theotokos and the cross are tying together. The, the birth of Christ and the death of Christ are really getting at the same, the same question is who was born, who died on the cross? Is it proper to say that God died on the cross? And, or is it proper to say, uh, or, or should we say something less strong than that? Nestorius believed that we should say something less strong than that. Uh, he, he was not comfortable saying that God died on the cross. Um, and, and he had his reasons there. Uh, ironically, he, attri he attributes um, uh, Cyril of uh, being Greek minded, but not in the same sense of what you would think of, of like the Hellenization thesis that developed in the 20th century, which tied the classical doctrines of God, which I mentioned earlier, to Greek philosophy. Uh, Nestorius was w wanted to avoid saying that the person who was born to Mary, the person who died on the cross was God. He wanted to say avoid saying things like Mary is the mother of God or God died on the cross because he was so committed to the classical doctrine of divine impassibility. Uh, he was he was committed to it in a, in a bad way uh, to the point where he was actually letting he was the Hellenizer, so to speak, uh, not mm. Cyril, uh, even though he was charging Cyril with being Greek and that he was making Mary a, like a mother of the divine nature. So you have Nestorius. Um, can I ask a, a, just a question of clarification here? So Nestorius is, um, he, he believes that there was someone born of Mary and that came from the line of David. That's, that's a, that's a true person, but the divine logos in the divine, you know, eternally existing with God in eternity past, still a third person of the Trinity. It sounds, but that third person of the Trinity attached himself to the descendant of David. So not one person, uh, but two persons united. Uh, and that's a huge distinction where we would say we have one Christ, one person uh, that took on human flesh. Uh, so uh, in, instead of attaching two separate persons together, is that the, the distinction? And then I guess I would ask like a follow-up question to that. If that is the case, and, and maybe I'm putting very humanized, you know, Western, you know, even maybe even... Um, you know, uh, entertainment based, you know, uh, questions to this, but like, did he have this view that the divine God possessed the human body or that there were two warring persons inside this one united, you know, body? What was going on there? Yes. Yeah, so I guess going back to your, your first question, uh, I think that is a fair description of Nestorianism is that you have this, this kind of loose union of two persons, um, it's it's not one person, but the divine logos re re retains a distinct personhood from the son of David uh, or the person that was born to Mary. Um, and, he, and he has kind of an instrumental view of this. So I think you're right, like this kind of idea of possession or, or those kind of things. He says uh, in one of his letters to Cyril, he says the incarnate the incarnate God did not die. He raised up the one in whom he was incarnate. He stooped down to raise up what had collapsed, but he did not fall. So there you see this idea of, of the human person, so to speak, is someone, it's like an instrument for him. It's, it's, the, it's the temple that he, um, the meat puppet, and dwells and, and, and identifies with in a loose personal way, but not in a hypostatic union, as we would, like you said, like you mentioned, one Lord, one Christ, um, those, that kind of thing. Right. And, and just for our viewers, not everybody knows what hypostatic union is. Could you just maybe explain difference between hypostatic union, for including definition, and maybe a definition of Nestorius, the Nestorian view as distinct from that? You, you kind of began down that road, but maybe you could uh, a yeah. little more sharply help our viewers understand uh, hy the hypostatic union. Yeah, so the, the hypostatic union uh, is, is really the belief that Jesus Christ uh, is 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 one person who possesses two natures, the divine nature and the human nature. Uh, and he possesses those two natures uh, without confusion, without mixture, without division and without separation. It's the Chalcedonian definition that we have one person who is at one and the same time fully God and fully man. So everything that you can say about man 
And everything that you can say about God, you can say about this one person who is Christ, uh, who is Jesus. And you, you know, you abstract it according to which um, nature you're referring to, I guess, so to speak. So Christ is um, Christ is at one and the same time uh, the one who is omniscient and the one who learns. He learns by virtue of his human nature because human natures learn. Uh, he is omniscient according to his divine nature because divine nature by definition is omniscient. So. Okay. Yeah. It, whereas Nestorius and one of our viewers, uh, Dustin Neely put this in the, in the chat. I can't remember. I, I read it like a little while ago in the chat, uh, Josh, if you want to put it up, but he says that the Nestorian view is basically like two wooden planks nailed together as these two, uh, these two natures. There it is. Uh, Nestorianism, simple explanation. Jesus' two natures are stuck together. Think of two pieces of wood hammered together with nails. Would you agree with that kind of articulation? Basically, do you agree with Dustin? I think, I, I, um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I would want to, yeah, like the two natures stuck together in a sense of like, they they are united and there's two per it's there's two persons as as well um so not not just two natures but two persons uh involved right uh, to where so, the human so participates the wood kind of the wood illustration kind of falls apart in a sense because the wood is inanimate and not not cognizant in personhood right so that's where yeah. the distinction would be a little different but dustin's point is more talking about how they're united two separate pieces united together two separate persons united together. So as far as, as far as the illustration will allow it, that seems, that yeah, seems I, I think it's, I think it's a fair one. And I, I've used, um, you know, a, a Coke bottle and a Sprite bottle before to show the various Christological heresies. Anytime you start to use drinks to show who Christ is, you can only show a bad view of who Christ is. <laughs> and good. I've used the two just I, kind of stuck together to, to, to show. I just um, wish you had a Coke and a Sprite on you right now. Cause I almost just want fantastic. to give that for us. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's basically the same thing. I mean, I think it's fair. I mean, I think I would just say it's two persons instead of two, you know, two natures. Yeah, we've got to be so particular with our language and, and discussion here. So we have we have Nestorius, and we haven't really explained, um, you know, Cyril of Alexander's position, partially because we kind of assume that it's part of that hypostatic thing that you mentioned earlier. But before we kind of dive into Cyril's response and his belief, could maybe you explain to us the you mentioned one of them, but the Bible verses that Nestorius is going to use to build his position. You mentioned earlier that he's a bishop. He's kind of, you know, a pastor. So he's overseeing churches. He's overseeing a region. He's a scholar. He's a theologian of his day, if you will. Um, he certainly didn't have access to Logos Bible software. Um, but, but I mean, he is a scholar of his day. He's a leader. And he's not trying yeah. to invent doctrines that are going to damn people's souls for eternity. Um, but he's looking to the scriptures and trying to make sense of the scriptures to the best of his ability. What Bible verses were compelling him to come up with this view that there are two, two persons that are, that are somehow united in the Christ figure? Well, I mean, some of the, the same verses really that, um, the Cyril will look, look to, I mean, Philippians two played an important role in both the stories, uh, framework and, in, in Cyril's, um, and he he took the um, he took the form of God and form of man kind of idea to be two persons. Um, some other things about uh, you know just basic you know classical doctrine of God like he's omniscient or you know the, any kind of those verses he would use to kind of highlight that that um, that God couldn't you know do such things like Hebrews seven he says that you know when he's when he's highlighting the Melchizedek, Melchizedek tie saying that Christ is without father or with a mother genealogy he's using that to say hey well that of course then god is not or mary is not the mother of god because you see it says right here uh hebrews 7 or what is born of flesh is flesh john 3. he's taking these verses and i think applying them wrongly uh to the person of christ um and that's really the 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 just the gist of the of the difference is there's um nestorius is taking some passages uh and he's he's kind of abstracting about who Christ is in, in, in bad ways from those passages. So he's not he's not proof texting his verses and ignoring the other verses like we see a lot of modern debates on YouTube and Facebook. It's an interpretive question. It's a we're using the same verses, but we're actually debating the application and interpretation to those verses. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, in so, some ways, yes. I mean, I haven't seen him talk about, you know, Acts 20, where it says that God died or God shed his blood. Uh, so I wonder if he would, how we, how he would ad- address that issue. Just to some kind of clever um, Jesus juke on it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, he says, um, I was going to ask you about that verse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he well, may have like, you know, he may, I'm like, I'm not like a Cyril and Nestorius scholar. So I'm very grateful to be here and talk about it there. But, but, you know, to, to, <laughs> to, to deal, to dive into some of those questions, I, you know, those are questions I have myself is how did he deal with Acts 20? Do we have record even today of how he dealt with Acts 20? Is that record reliable? Those kind of things. So, okay. Uh, but yeah, Hunter, that's Nestorius. Yeah. I, I want to read a quote from your article and then ask you a question based on this. So to Nestorius, Jesus related to the second person of the Trinity in the same way believers like Abraham did, but Jesus did so more completely than anyone ever had. Thus in Nestorius system, the incarnation wasn't unique in kind, but intensity. Jesus wasn't truly God in flesh, but merely a man who had a unique relationship with the word. Nestorius then was willing to call, uh, was willing to call Mary mother of Christ, but not mother of God. So mm-hmm. um, Nestorius, it, you mentioned earlier, he considers Arianism a damnable heresy. Um, and of course, the, you know, the Arians, there was a say there was a time when, uh, when Jesus was not, that he was created. So he puts him on this sort of like less than plane. But then it seems like Nestorius commits the same error in putting Jesus on a less than plane. Um, was he willing to say, I worship Jesus? Or would he only say, well, I worship the Logos, but but not Jesus? Like, like what, what did he say yeah, he, to that? Yeah, so he was he would say that he would worship Jesus, but he would not worship. Uh, he worshiped Jesus because of the the divine person who was conjoined to him um so he says i revere the one who is born because of the one who carried him i worship the one I see but the one who is hidden yeah it's undivided yeah. the one I revere. and therefore i do not divide the honor of that which is not divided i divide the natures but i unite the the worship uh, he says that which was formed in the womb is not itself god uh, and he goes on and says that which was formed in the womb is not in itself God. And so mm-hmm. he's he is OK with worshiping Christ, but he's the way he worships Christ is different than the way that Cyril worships Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cyril worships Christ as being God in the flesh. Like he is like you're you're when you see Jesus sleep, when you see him weep, when you see him do these, you're seeing God do these things and you're worshiping him. Um, you know, undividedly as, as the one person. Uh, whereas Nestorius would say, I'm worshiping him because it's not divided, but I'm really, I'm really just worshiping the divine person who is, who's carrying this person that I see in front of me. Like, like I'm, if I'm, I'm worshiping I'm the two by four on the left, not the two by four on the right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, worshiping I'm worshiping both, but because of the two by four on the left, if that makes sense. So yeah. he says, okay. I'm holding it together because I have to, but it's this when I see when I see this person die on the cross, I'm not seeing God die on the cross. And the reason for this is divine impassibility, right? There's this doctrine that says that God doesn't change. Uh, you know, he's all powerful. Uh, this idea of Jesus getting tired or hungry does not show all powerfulness. Therefore, for Nestorius, he has to separate these two persons in such a way to make a theological explanation for why Jesus would get hungry for why Jesus would get tired, for why Jesus would die or be born for that matter. And he's he can't yeah. he can't see how those two things are reconcilable. This would probably be a good way for us to go, how does Cyril of Alexander find those things to be reconcilable? How can the doctrine that God be all powerful be true, Jesus be God and take a nap? Like how's that a thing? <laughs> yeah, and and he he talks about it one he 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 does appeal to mystery in, in some regards. But he says it's, a, it's an incomprehensible union of these two natures in one person such that, like I said, I mentioned earlier, anything that you can say about the human nature, you can say about Christ and anything you can say about the divine nature, you can say about Christ. Uh, but you have to be careful in how you say it. So Jesus slept not because he was um, 
Jesus slept not because he was God. He slept because he had a human nature. So we say a divine person died on the cross by virtue of his human nature. God died on the cross. God the Son died on the cross. God the Son died on the cross um, by virtue of his human nature. I, I took that from a friend named Joel Chop. He, he shared that in a text message with me, so I'm citing him in that. But that's that's kind of Cyril's argument is we're looking when we see Jesus in the in the Gospels, we're seeing God. Uh, he is God in the flesh. In fact, that's that's one of the ways he highlights um, Philippians two. He says when you look at Philippians two and you take in a story and framework to a Philippians two, you do not see the form of God in the form of the servant. You 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 just don't. You don't see those two together. They're not united. But when when Cyril looks at the form of the servant, he is looking at one who is also in the form of the God in form of God. Whereas an historian can't say that. Uh, or Nestorius mm-hmm. can't say that. And so for Cyril, he is he's holding these two things together and he's saying one person is doing these things, but he's abstracting from there um, the nature by virtue which he can do such things. So Jesus can die. He can be born not by virtue of his divinity, but by virtue of his humanity, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Okay. So like, what do you think Nestorius would say to like Luke chapter two, angels are all celebrating the birth of Christ and, and they refer to him as an infant as Christ the Lord. So one seems to, to speak into his humanity, Christ, the other and his deity Lord and, um, and they're worshiping. Uh, I mean, I, I suppose he could say they're, they're saying glory to God, uh, so they're maybe they're yeah. worshiping the Father, uh, or or maybe they're they're worshiping Jesus, but just the divine part of it. I, I just wonder how they would th- think through verses like that. Yeah, and, and you know, at the end of the day, and just, uh, Cyril just basically says that Nestorius' system can't work, and that he's basically continuing the error of the Arians. Um, I mean, that's real. That's that you know, that's the funny thing too is they both call each other Arian. And I did see a, a, so, someone say in the in the chat, uh, Carl Peterson. Yes, both of them held to divine impassibility. Uh, and they were both committed to those doctrines. Uh, they were just committed to them in um, in different ways. So it's it's they both would worship Christ. They would just do so differently. And Cyril's whole point was saying you're not you're not really, um, you know, Nestorius would say you're committing idolatry by worshiping a man. And Cyril would communi- would come back at, to Arius and say, I mean, not Arius, Nestorius, and say, you're basically being Arian. You're not, you're, um, you're, you're, you're basically conceding the point of Arius and trying to come up with a different way to frame who Christ is. Because Arius would say, you know, look at what Christ is doing in the Gospels. He's clearly not equal with the Father. And Nestorius will, will go, well, yeah, if, if that's, if that's, if we're saying God died on the cross or God was born to Mary, then yes, that would be the case. So Nestorius is actually conceding, um, I think, too much ground to Arius. Uh, I'm not saying he's doing so consciously. consciously. I'm just saying uh, functionally or effectively he's doing so. Certainly. Now, we've, we've mentioned this verse multiple times in relation to um, heresy of an overrealized kenosis or an overrealized emptying in Philippians yeah. 2, and maybe I can just have you walk through, and, and you can take a pause and say, I want to speak as a theologian and a scholar, not necessarily speaking for Cyril, not necessarily speaking for Nestorius, and say, hey, this passage, this is what it means, and this is how it feeds into this discussion. So feel free to s- speak out of your own person or the persons of these other two people. Speak out of one of the three persons. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, Here in Philippians 2, this is 5 through 11. Have this mind in yourselves that is in Christ. So he wants us to look at how Christ operated in the earth and say, we want you to think and live this way. And in verse 6, he says, who though he was in the form of God, did not uh, count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and that every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, translation, I am reading from the extra snobby version, so uh, the ESV. So uh, anyway, uh, without further ado, I'll toss it over to Hunter. How, how, how would you know either of them speak to it? How do we understand this today? Uh, not just in modern scholarship, I hate to say that, but where did the church land on this historically? Because like you said, um, modern scholarship has kind of moved away from what has been the historic 
teachings of the church. Um, would you would you kind of lay into us about how, how did the early church understand this passage and as it relates to the hypostatic union? Yes, and I always get nervous talking about this passage in particular because there's so many landmines. Um, but but yes, yeah, so one of the key things that uh, Cyril is communicating in in that passage, he he relies on Philippians two, uh, and, I, and I say kind of I say in my article that according to Cyril's interpretation, the word emptied himself not by dispensing with any aspect of his divine nature, but by taking on the limitations of humanity. And then this assumption of the human nature, Cyril clarified nothing in, in Jesus's divine nature underwent any change, nor he, you know, nor did he like somehow inherit the divine nature from Mary or make himself subordinate to the father. None of those things are happening. But when it's talking about he emptied himself, uh, what he's doing, what, what I think Cyril is communicating there is one, that Christ is taking on all that it means to be human, yet is without sin. So he is he is taking on every limitation of humanity, um, the, the one, the ability to grow and develop, to uh, to die, to grow tired, to grow, to grow weary I mean, and weep and, and no, all of those different things of of, you know, he, he he takes on what it means to be uh, human. And that is the framework of understanding the emptying self, not that anything in his divine nature changed, underwent any loss or he forgo such a, you know, any kind of attribute, so to speak. Uh, he's also holding this in a framework of divine simplicity. And so he's he's not saying that Christ lost anything in the emptying. What he's saying is, is Christ assumed the limitations of all that it means to be human, yet was without sin. Can um, you and can so, you maybe help me unpack that one word then, emptying? And that's and I know that it's like I'm making you nervous and now I'm pressing you on something that makes you nervous. So I'm gonna ramble for a little bit and give you time to think up an answer. Um on that word emptying, I know that a lot of modern scholarship, again, will say, hey, like you mentioned just now, I think R.C. Sproul has kind of said it in a similar way uh, where, you know, God didn't empty himself of divinity. He added the weakness of humanity. And that's such a beautiful way of, of looking at infinite, all-powerful God adding weakness, not emptying divinity. And I've also heard it said, and, and we've often articulated here on the show, um, that that we we see Jesus choosing not to act on certain divine prerogatives. He's fully God, but choosing not to act on those things, rather humbling himself, submitting to the will of the Father, you know, do, uh, uh, being empowered by the work of the Spirit. Like we, we see a, a natural submission in that regard. But how am I supposed to understand? And you can clean up any of my language if I did something wrong there. Um, but, but within that, how am I to understand the word empty if empty doesn't mean empty? If empty actually means choosing not to act. Why didn't it just say choosing not to act? Like, how, how, how am I supposed to comprehend that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I would, um, would would point people to is that that that's one, not the only passage that speaks on who Christ is. So Colossians 1 is another key one that in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Um, uh, he good. was one that, you know, he's the, he's the image of the, you know, of, of the father and, and those things who's equal in all things to him who begot him. Uh, Cyril actually says on on page 86 of this book, he says, what is this emptying out? It is his life in the form of a slave in the flesh, which he assumes. It is a likeness to us of one who is not as we are in his own nature, since he is above all creation. In this way, he humbled himself, economically submitting himself to the limitations of the manhood. So in that, he, there, I, you know, I would say that there is a, a lowering or an emptying um, and that he is he is. Um, taking on the limit, limitations of, of humanity, uh, but at the same time, not ceasing to be God or not diminishing his divine nature in any way uh, whatsoever. Uh -huh. So um, that's how I would communicate that. So in, the, in a, an understanding of that in the, in the incarnation, Christ maintains his divine nature fully uh, and without change, yet he undergoes um, the experiences of loss, um, death suffering that which was um that he, he he did not could not know in his divine nature if that makes sense okay yeah so i i, I want to just maybe speak for the person who's watching today who's thinking man you it sounds to me like you guys are just splitting hairs and astorius gets blamed for being uh, a uh heretic and you have it, it 
two doctrines that sound really similar. You have, you know, Cyril and the historic Orthodox Church saying hy the hypos there's the hypostatic union. Uh, there's Christ is fully God and fully man united in one person. So if if Jesus gets tired, it's the whole person that gets tired. Uh, and yet we would say at the same time, his tiredness comes from his human nature, not from his divine nature. And, and Nestorius, you know, this, the same person listening might think, well, it sounds like he says something kind of similar that he says that, well, it's the, the human part that is getting tired, not the divine part. And it's just, Nestorius will divide it into two separate persons altogether, whereas we in historic orthodoxy would say, well, it's only one person, the person of yeah. Jesus, who has two natures. Again, Nestorius coming back, no, it's two separate persons. But then when you drill down, they're both saying, you know, separating between the divine part and the human part. So, like, my point is, Help us understand why this isn't just splitting hairs. Help us understand why this is actually a really big deal and why the church throughout history has been right to label Nestorius as a heretic uh, in, instead of just saying, well, it's a little off, but, you know, he tried hard. Like, why, why is this such a big deal? And as many puns as we can make about heresy and splitting hairs would be good because it's just, it's that fine of a line because <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why you that's call true. it heresy after all. Am I right? No, keep, keep going. Yes. Yes. And um, I don't, I, you know, I would, I would say, I don't think they're splitting hairs. I do think that they're, they're getting at something that's really important um, in, in the gospel witness. Uh, when, when we see the gospel witness, we see one person uh, who is, who is Jesus Christ. And that one person is both confessed to be truly God and truly man. Um, and, and so when we see these things and we say it's, it's very important for the redemption of humanity, that for Christ to be both medi be mediator between God and man, and for him for him to be fully God and fully um, man. So sorry, I'm, I'm trying to think through how I want to articulate this. So when we when we say that Jesus is God in the flesh, and that He is God, and that the Son of God died for our sins on the cross. We're making a very important statement about who it is on the cross, what it is that is happening, the reconciliation between God and man. And with Nestorius's separation of, of, the, of the one person into two persons, you actually begin to undermine the very foundations of the media, mediatory work uh, that Christ was doing on behalf mm. of his people on the That's cross. Good. That's good. Yeah, uh, there was somebody in our chat who was uh, who was quoting one of the Gregories and, um, uh, and the quote is, um, what he has not assumed has not, whatever he has not assumed has not Cannot been be healed. healed. Yeah. Right. That's right. And it, it is what is united to his divinity that is saved. So, uh, so like you were talking, like this is laying the very foundation for our redemption that Jesus became like yeah. us in every respect except sin. Because if he just yeah. became mostly like us, or a little bit like us, or a lot like us, or uh, or not like us at all, and just kind of had this sort of meat puppet, as Josh likes to say, that he inspired yeah. and guided, uh, then he hasn't assumed humanity in a way right. that can save humanity. So I like the way you articulated that. That's good. Yeah, and I yeah, think I you're would... getting it. Is really go ahead, please. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think that's when we think about the the creeds that developed in the early church, you know, Nicaea, Chalcedon, um, and even going into, you know, even further down the road into, you know, does Christ have one will or two wills? Uh, all of these things, they're not they're not just sitting around speculating about metaphysical realities or, or whatever is they're concerned about the gospel. They're concerned about. The, the reconciliation between God and man and and these different heresies that come up, whether it's Gnosticism or Arianism or uh, Apollinarianism or, you know, Eutychianism or whatever you want to, whatever heresy you want to throw out in Nestorianism, um, you Coke start to see the, the what? I said Coke bottleism. It really oh, Coke bottle -ism. he was any, looking any, for any, modalism. Any, you don't have to laugh. Coke bottle demonstration of who Christ Ooh. is. All of those <laughs> things undermine the gospel proclamation 
that this one person made reconciliation between God and man. And, um, and, and, this, and their concern is for the gospel, uh, the care of the souls that have been entrusted to them, and they're, they're not concerned with, um, you know, philosophical speculation that, that they are very, they do make use of philosophy. They're not afraid to do that. Uh, and sometimes they don't do it perfectly. Uh, but they, their main concern is teaching what the Bible says about who Christ is, what he has done for his people, and doing so in a way that doesn't undermine the message of reconciliation that God has made between himself and us through Christ Jesus. So I've got two questions right now. I've got one question for the lay person that's watching and they're going, I don't know if a person walked off the street and asked me to articulate Christology that I would do it in such an accurate way to be considered orthodox. Am I eternally damned? <laughs> that's a big deal. Um, and then a subsequent question that I would kind of ask on the back end of that is uh, the the Chalcedonian definition um, was not put together until later after this event. So did this event... Um, did it formalize language that helped inspire that later event? And then maybe you can, maybe we can, you know, spiral into Chalcedonian definition because not all churches agree to that, right? Like that's not, that's a pretty Western uh, confession. Whereas, you know, Nicaea is something that we can all agree on, right? The Orientals, the, well, I say Oriental, it depends on the 325. Okay. The 325 Nicaean yeah. Creed, right? Everyone seemed to agree on that one. Whereas the kind of spurs off of that, you know, 381, Council of Ephesus, you know, Chalcedon, not everyone seems to agree and affirm to those. So first question is, if they don't articulate the perfect human and divine nature of Jesus, does that make them eternally damned? And then secondly, uh, on, on the tail end of that, where does Chalcedon kind of fit in with historic Christian faith? Yeah, and I don't think... Um one has to articulate it with the exact clarity that we would expect, um, you know, pastors or scholars or whoever you want to say. I do think there are certain things that you can't deny, so to speak. Uh, so if you were to deny that the person who died on the cross was God in the flesh. That's good. Whether or not you could articulate a cool, you know, a full, you know, Orthodox Christology or not, um, you know, Josh say, hey, yeah, yeah, you probably don't believe the gospel. But if you were to, you know, if you were to hear the statement, hey, Jesus is fully God and fully man, and he died on the cross to make reconciliation between God and man, was buried and rose, and rose from the grave that you might be saved. Uh, and you articulate that and you say, yes, I believe that. And then, yes, like, I think you're, you're, you're fine. Do you have to articulate Chalcedonian definition that, you know, there's one person, two natures without division parts uh, or without division, without separation, without confusion or mixture? No, I don't think you have to. Um, and, and even there are people who disagree with it. I, you know, I don't, um, I want to be very careful, uh, and how I, you know, and, and charitable to others. I do think it's important. I do think it's primary, uh, but also recognize that, um, that there, some people might be trying to articulate the same, th this something for the same motivations that people who were, um, trying to articulate this doctrine, uh, in that day. Um, I think that's answering your, does that, does that, answer your first question kind of satisfactorily. Yeah, yeah that, I think that answers my first question in that uh, Christian orthodoxy is not in your ability to affirm it necessarily, but in your in in what you deny. So like the thief on the cross did not have a full orbed, you know, understanding of Jesus's fully divine and human nature and how those things relate. But in what we deny, if it's like I've studied this out, I've researched it and I've come to the conclusion that Jesus isn't God, right? Like if you come to that conclusion, yeah. you're in trouble, right? Like you can't deny yeah. that. Um, but if you can't fully articulate, like I have children who might not be able to articulate the Trinity perfectly. I mean, they get pretty yeah. darn close. They've got Nicaea memorized. Yeah. So like uh, they, they could, they could get close, but only if they're quoting it, if you ask them to start describing it, they have gonna, the Nicaea song it. memorized. <laughs> but Hey, just because they yeah. say the Nicene Creed to a tune doesn't make it any less memorized, Michael. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, all that, all that to say, um, they, they've, uh, they could probably get close, but you start asking them, you know, you know, is Jesus God? Yeah. And, and if you pushed them, you might you might get them to stumble on something, which is not the same as denying something. So I guess my my next question was, how does Chalcedon fit into all of this? Because there are churches who will not affirm Chalcedon. What should we think of those communities? And I know that that's a, a difficult question. I'm not asking you necessarily to to weigh in on whether they're saved or Christians. And, and maybe I am kind of yeah. you know figure that out on your own um, but like I, I would say yeah. as a Protestant like you know if you're gonna if you're gonna be 
Um, and our, certainly if you're going to be a pastor, certainly if you're going to lead, I, I want you a forming chalcedon. I think that's a biblical definition. I, I might even say church members, like I wouldn't want you to deny this. Um, how would you, how would you lay into the Chalcedonian definition? Yeah. You know, I, I'm not too familiar with many, many churches that don't affirm it. I guess Coptic churches wouldn't, some of the Nestorian churches obviously wouldn't, um, you know, the, uh, some, some of the Egyptian ones potentially, I, I don't know all the, 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 the various strains of different things. Um, if, if there was someone that, let's say a staff person or whatever that we were interviewing uh, and they said, I deny Calcedon, that would be an immediate <laughs> no hire. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I do think it's um, pretty broadly affirmed uh, for the most part uh, to the point to where I do think it's one of those key um, defining, um, you know, I'm with you. markers. Um, I'm, so I'm with you. You I, can't. I'm a little bit cool I, saying that, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think you can deny Chalcedon and the hypostatic union and uh, be saved. Sorry, I don't. So, go ahead, Michael. Um, well, I was going to have him comment on a part of the Chalcedonian Creed, but uh, go ahead, finish your thought. Well, no, I was going to say maybe we should read Chalcedon for people who are out there. But if you've well, got a question, what do you know? It. We great minds <laughs> think alike. Okay, so um, I'll I'll read. Oh gosh, where do I even begin? Um, okay, I, I'm going to pick up about midway through describing Jesus where it says in all things like unto us without sin begotten before all ages of the father, according to the Godhead in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God. So now it's like we can see the intentionality of including that mother of God in there. According yeah. to manhood, one in the same Christ, son, Lord, only begotten to be acknowledged in two natures. And then here's the part I want you to comment on inconfusably, uh, confusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of nature God. being by no means taken away by the union. Okay, so those four words, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, uh, are they trying to say four different things? Or do they just trying to multiply words just to say, like, we really mean it? Like, what, what do they mean by this? Yeah, so I think like um, without confusion, for instance, would say, "Hey, yes, Jesus, Mary did give birth to the divine nature of 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 the Son." Well, that would be a confusion of the natures. You can't a human cannot give birth to a divine nature, or mm -hmm. saying that Jesus died according to his divine nature. He became hungry because he was divine. That's confusing the two natures. So that's one way to go about it. Jesus, Jesus was born. Uh, he became hungry. He died because he assumed a human nature um, without change would be um, to communicate that in the taking on of humanity, the divine nature didn't undergo any change. He, it didn't it didn't lose any attributes. It didn't um, it didn't become something different. It didn't become a third thing, uh, which gets into the without mixture idea. But the divine nature uh, remained um as it was, it didn't undergo change in the incarnation uh, without division would, I think, be Nestorianism, what we've been talking about or without separation uh, and without division. I, I would under I would want to know a little bit more about those, you know, those two things. Those two things might be getting it towards close to the same thing. But mm -hmm. the idea is that the human nature and the divine nature are not divided. Um, they are united in one person uh, and they are one person. They're not separate. You know, you don't, you don't have two separate persons in engaged there so yeah Excellent. What, would, so, what were the last two terms that you had because i'm looking at something a little bit different than what you said you said uh -oh. inconfusedly uh, uh unchanging in, inconfusably inconfusedly that's a hard one unchangeably indivisibly inseparably yeah and i think at the indivisibly the indivisibly thing um also comes into one of the things that this that cyril was pointing out was that in the stories this framework the the son could also then one at some point in time in the future at least theoretically forgo the the human nature he could discard it um and in the hypostatic union that that's not possible right okay that now talk to us about way. um maybe modern expressions of um 
are just modern expressions of Christological heresy, but maybe especially Nestorianism. I mean, you mentioned some Nestorians still being around today, like where, which caves yeah. are they hiding out in? And, oh, uh, <laughs> and are, are they like, is this cropping up with sort of like a, you know, like Nestorianism with a facelift? Have you ever seen anything like this or was it really pretty dang unique to this season of history? Yeah. I mean, I think any, uh, any teaching out there that's uncomfortable saying, um, that Jesus is God, um, is, um, or, or that, and understanding that Jesus is doing things as God, um, might be, um, uh, a, a kind of a re-expression of this. I mean, I, you know, I kind of want, you know, like some of the most radical forms of canonicism, um, uh, may be a representation of, of, of Nestorianism. It may not be, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but they, there seems to be a little bit of, um, some sim similarities there of some similar moves that are being made, some sim similar arguments that are being made, uh, you know, because Jesus is sleeping and different things and, you know, he's, you know, getting it to um, mm -hmm. a bad understanding of, of, of what we were talking about earlier with Philippians 2. So what about the Protestant that's listening to our conversation right now? And they keep hearing us talking about Jesus being fully God, Mary giving birth to God, Theotokos language and they're like we are protesting some of the weird Mary stuff still like uh, you guys are yeah. you know th there have been a, a group of Roman Catholics who take Theotokos Mary mother of God and go therefore she is the greatest of all you know humans that don't have a divine nature you know with the exception of Christ you know Jesus is the head of humanity and Mary is sitting at his right hand as it were you know like she is she is the queen of heaven she has given birth to God um, I, I would say in some in some real sense that the Protestant church, as they have really tried to combat some of the Roman Catholic abuses, have probably made Mary like nothing, right? Where she's like, she should be blessed among women, right? Like she there's blessed are you, Mary, right? Like there's a there's a good, uh, a great godly example that we have in Mary. We shouldn't necessarily discount that, but that at the same time, there seems to be this high elevation of Mary. The second that you open the gates for Theotokos language, you know, we're just we're we're, we're borderline worshiping Mary. Um, how would you maybe navigate or instruct us to think about the Theotokos in regards to the way that some take that and run with it? Yeah, I mean, I think my my main point would be to say that Mary being the Theotokos really has nothing to do with who Mary is, but everything to do with who Jesus is. Um, so that would be my first um, idea. I would say Protestants who affirm that Jesus is God in the flesh uh, are standing in more continuity with Cyril than Catholics who would try to, to communicate um, that Mary is like the co redemptrix of heaven or something like that. So I think that's a, um, a perversion of the biblical truth, um, whereas Mary being the Theotokos is the, you know, the, the, the very thing of Matthew 1, the person that she's going to give birth to is Emmanuel, God with us. So mm -hmm. I think if for people who are uncomfortable with the term Theotokos or Mary being the mother of God, they're, they're uncomfortable with a problem that isn't really inherent in, the, in that term or in that debate. They're uncomfortable with other aspects of who Mary is um, or, or who Mary is thought to be uh, by people who are, are really corrupting the, the text, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, so I want to come back to the word becoming flesh. Can you talk to us about the centrality of this in the debate between Cyril and Nestorius? Yeah, I think that the viewer that, uh, that highlighted the Gregory quote is, is exactly that. What is not assumed is not healed. I mean, I think Cyril is just taking, Cyril is, it views himself as taking the thought of Nicaea and defending it and, and making it, um, uh, and, and applying it to this particular problem uh, that has come up in the church through the teaching of Nestorius. So I think that idea of Christ taking on what, is, what it means to be truly human, yet without sin. So he's not taking on sinful flesh. He's taking on, you know, humanity, human nature as, as it, it was intended to be. And, and, he is, and he is assuming, you know, all that it means to be human, rational soul, body, uh, rightly related, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and for the sake of, making uh, reconciliation between God and man. Okay. So I think, I think he's just, I think he sees himself standing in the, 
um, in the stream with the Cappadocian Fathers and, and the framers of Nicaea. Sweet. Okay. okay. Hey, I think this is the point where we got to wrap. We're at 4.55. So uh, I, I guess I toss it over to you guys to give some kind of closing thoughts. I'll toss it over to Michael. Kind of one thing that you want people to walk away, uh, thinking about meditating on, uh, processing as they go through this conversation on Nestorianism, uh, this divine, na two divine natures, one person, not two persons united in some kind of meat puppet. Uh, I, I like saying it, and really, it's it's not accurate representation. But regardless, I'll, I'll ask Michael to uh, give some closing thoughts, uh, and then uh, I'll do the same uh, for our guest, and then we will wrap this puppy up. Uh, Michael, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, man, I think my closing thought, I don't think I can do uh, do better than that quote, whatever is not assumed is not healed. But just to emphasize the, the importance of this is not it's not just splitting hairs. This is talking about the very nature of redemption itself and how it happens and who Jesus is, this very one that we worship. Uh, so this is really a huge deal. And you go to Hebrews uh, chapter two and kind of flowing from chapter one, where it's it's not the angels that he helps, but it's the descendants of Abraham. And he had to become like us in every respect in order to save us. And uh, and if he didn't become like us in every respect, he couldn't save us. And Jesus didn't become an angel to save angels. He became a human to save humans. And so we really do have to emphasize Jesus really did become a man. The word really did become flesh. And, uh, it, and by emphasizing this, we're emphasizing the work of God in Christ for salvation, for redemption. It's a, it's a really huge deal. Sometimes it feels like we're splitting hairs on theology. Uh, but when you really get down to it, the nature of redemption and the person of Jesus, the one that we worship, well, that's pretty big stuff, actually. It's not small potatoes. So I think Amen. I would leave with that, with that thought. Whatever is not assumed is not healed. This is a huge deal. Amen. Hunter, off to you, my friend. Yes, I, mean, I think that's uh, a great thought to... Um, to end with and it's this idea of of he's he's not only assuming uh, that so that he could heal it he's assuming what we are so that he could bring us uh to where he is i mean it's this idea of of we get to we really do get to partake of the divine nature uh second peter one because of what christ has done for us we we get to uh you know know that all the promises of god are yes in christ that christ we our lives are hidden with Christ in God, you know, this, we are really being brought, there's a movement, not only he's coming to heal, but there's also a movement towards uh, glorification and, uh, you know, all that will, will come about in the, uh, um, the, the end, end, end days or the, the eschaton and the resurrection of the flesh where we will see God and become like him. So that, that would be my, my close. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for jumping on Hunter, Michael. I appreciate it. And, and then for those of you who are watching, you're like, man, this stuff on Christology seems complicated. There seems to be a lot going on. You've mentioned a lot of names historically. Uh, I just want to remind you, we have entire playlists dedicated to the Trinity, dedicated to Christology. You can go watch our interviews with scholars and pastors that we've discussed these things through. We've talked about uh, Nicaea. If you want to go watch our episodes on Nicaea, I think we've got like two or three episodes done with Matthew Escovel. And when we did that series on Back to the Fathers, uh, we've got episodes episodes on like the subordination of the sun. We had uh, Scott Harrell come on from Dallas Theological Seminary and discuss that with us. We've had, uh, man, just Robert Lethem has come on and talked about uh, the Trinity with us. We've had uh, Holy Spirit conversations, Christological conversations. If you're interested in learning more about the Trinity, more about Christology, check out some of those playlists. And can I just encourage you to do that? Um, I know it sounds like a heady exercise, but what I have found is when I study the Trinity, my heart is more worshipful than when I study literally any other doctrine in the Christian faith. Like I can sit there and read about penal substitution. I can read about, you know, the transfer of my debt uh, uh, to God and God's God's record of righteousness to me and and that that beautiful exchange. And, and it just doesn't do as much for me experientially as when I study the Trinity. My heart gets wrapped up in it. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about when he's saying that he wants us to worship him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and certainly that's a quote from Deuteronomy imported into the New Testament, but we've got this idea that we we really need to worship God with our with our mind. Like, that's a really good thing, and I think that we'll find that when our mind is rightly set on the true God, that our heart and our emotions are stirred up right along with Him. So I'd encourage you to do that. It might seem like a an exercise of futility, of something that you, you might not be... 
Is my screen shaking from the train? Do you guys see that? How wild is that? I mean, there's a train <laughs> traveling by outside and I can see my camera shaking. Anyway, uh, regardless, uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to study the Trinity. It is actually good for you uh, and good for your worship in Christ. Anyway, all that to say, uh, Remnant Radio is still a crowdfunded channel. As it was at the beginning of the program, it's still a crowdfunded channel. If you want to support the links, you can give in the links in the description. Top link is for PayPal, and the, that second link right underneath it is for Patreon. If you just give on five bucks a month, you get access to extra content there on Patreon. Thank you, Hunter and Michael, for jumping on, and we'll see you guys next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time.